Um, so welcome everybody to our uh, last virtual webinar of, um, of the year for the Auckland Transportation uh, Group. Um, my name's David Matthews, I'm the chair of the Auckland branch. Uh, and today we've got Anthony Pierce, who's a planner with Auckland Transport, who's gonna be talking to us about uh, community, uh, connected communities. Um, this is a very, very significant um, uh, project. Uh, um, looking at a number of major arterials across the Auckland region um, and looking to focus on uh, reprioritization of corridor space uh, with a sort of key focus on safety, um, public transport and active modes. Um, so uh, I'll hand it over to Anthony and um, at the end I'll be capturing some questions and posing those to Anthony on your behalf. So Anthony, all yours. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, kia ora tato, everyone. Um, as Dave said, my name's Anthony Pierce. I'm a uh, senior transport planner at Auckland Transport and the planning and investment group. Um, my camera does flick off when I do share the screen, so I'm just going to start sharing now and begin uh, my presentation. Um, so yeah, as Dave mentioned, um, connected communities, it's a um, quite significant piece of work Auckland Transport is undertaking at the moment. Um, so just as a little contents, I'll give a bit of background about how the program was formed. Um, a large piece of work that was undertaken, um, which we call the network assessment. Um, and then just touching on some COVID impacts that we've had as a program team, um, the current regional land transport plan. Um, I apologize for some acronyms if they are unfamiliar to some of you. It's, the presentation's probably gonna be full of them. So I'll try and say the full, full, um, full piece. Um, and then looking at some corridor options and design challenges that, we're, that we've faced along the way and ending with um, our current, um, one of our current projects for New North Road. So a little bit of the background. Um, Auckland Transport up until 2018, uh, 2019 was investigating um, bus priority projects, safety projects and uh, active mode projects on as a team by team basis. Um, and they'd all mapped out their 10 year program um, as per the RLTP of that cycle. And they were all looking at, as, as I said, similar corridors and each of their projects all assumed to use the same road space. Um, very few of them accounted for any curb changes um, and then upon investigation um, that wasn't really achievable in locations where bike and bus infrastructure were located together. Teams hadn't taken into that, that into account. Um, so what we aimed to do as, a, as Auckland Transport and as a program team was merging um, public transport, AT Metro projects, walking and cycling and safety projects to deliver um, an integrated transport outcome. And yeah, as I mentioned, the complexity and the costs, especially the costs, um, were a lot greater than these individual teams anticipated. So when we sort of did a mapping exercise, this is a summary table, it kind of overlapped where um, the immediate cycle um, priorities were, where the safety priorities were, and where some bus improvements were, were prioritized. And we got our list of um, 10 corridors. So why some change is needed? Um, AT Metro and um, rolled out their new network in um, 2017 to 20, 2016 to 2018, um, and that had a huge increase in uh, bus patronage. Um, so we're really aiming to build on that now with more bus priority measures to improve that reliability and those journey times for those bus users. Um, reducing deaths and serious injuries along these corridors, as I mentioned, the safety team were investigating, or still are investigating a lot of these routes um, and vulnerable modes are overrepresented um, in the um, DSI stats. So that's pedestrians, uh, cyclists and motorcycle moped users. Um, we're really looking to grow active modes as a mode share percentage and rolling out of a connected cycle network, which you know also links into climate change resilience as well. So how to deliver significant mode share. Again, a little bit of the background, um, a lot of the corridors, these are two snapshots from New North Road, um, but that's not unique, are facing significant um, population increases, um, houses are becoming townhouses and apartments. Um, so the unitary plan changes has allowed significant growth. And then on top of that, 
um, central government's national policy statement um, on urban development near transport nodes, enables uh, quite significant growth on some bus corridors and near rail stations. And then currently the enabling housing supply amendments, which are the government's considering um, changes to the RMA, which would further increase densities. So current rates of growth are putting strain on our transport system, let alone some anticipated uh, growth predictions. So how do we really provide those um, viable and reliable alternatives to private vehicle travel? Um, again, a little bit of background for Auckland Transport. Um, we've been aiming as part of this program to create a social license, um, which involves listening and engaging the community um, avoiding the large scale backlash, which some of the other Auckland transport projects have suffered in the past. Um, we've begun this with New North Road, which I'll touch on a little bit later in the presentation. We've established uh, community collaboration panels, um, which has helped form uh, some of our options, which we'll be engaging with the general public on very soon in the new year, um, which will yeah, be hopefully, um, hopefully finalizing uh, the business case. So again, um, this is the summary of our program. Um, that shaded uh, blob here is some cycle, um, a cycling business case that um, we're also undertaking. Um, as you can see, that shaded area overlaps significant um, corridor routes. So where we're aiming to provide for cycling on these corridors, we also want to be looking at local area networks, um, you know, trips to and from local schools, lo local shops, and so not just those key arterials will have cycle facilities on them. We also want to, um, you know, avoid rat running and, and other potential problems that may occur um, when the corridors essentially go under change. So that's the two area based uh, for cycling and um, 10 corridors were identified and we confirmed business case funding with Waka Kotahi and Council in 2018. A little bit of the strategic context, um, the Auckland Transport Alignment Project, the Auckland Plan, um, central government policy statement on land transport, better travel choices, um, the RLTP, the regional public transport plan. There's a, a raft of strategic documents which are um, guiding and pushing uh, us in the right direction here. And let, um, plus other business cases which are help, uh, which are help guiding and we're taking the next step as connected communities going down into that next stage. When we first grouped together um, the corridors and obtained funding from Waka Kotahi, um, we set about undertaking a network assessment, um, which recognises the need to have a plan for the network rather than just a corridor by corridor basis. Um, we would understanding that change to one corridor would affect local surrounding streets and potentially other corridors as well. Some of them are quite close together. Um, it gives us the ability to model change to the corridors at a network level and the delivery of these corridors would be staged via recommendations from the network assessment. And this, um, as I mentioned, was an agreed assessment of the network with Waka Kotahi, and it's used as the basis for future uh, corridor business cases. And the network assessment can be updated as, the, as those finer details are worked through. Um, and this and the network assessment formed um, a large evidence base for our um, regional land transport plan bid for funding for the 21 to 23 timeframe. The layering of um, known transport issues onto our corridors, it really made them stand out. So um, where poor bus reliability was with levels of service D, E and F, where there was high risk intersections and corridors and uh, where there was um, high cycle demand, which had been modeled, but lack of separated facilities to encourage that use was, was all mapped out. So it kind of just emphasizes the need for change on a lot of these routes. Um, we had an agreed investment logic map again with Waka Kotahi, so setting out the, the key metrics for um, funding. So again, part of that network assessment is looking at the form and function of these corridors. How do we deliver change to them? Um, options were identified looking at future, future form and function of the corridor, which was linked to uh, roads and streets framework assessments. Um, Pedestrian footpaths were sort of as a given with AT standards, so we wouldn't be um, widening the corridor to um, delve, to, to cut into footpaths below, below standards. Um, and obviously critical issues such as costs and disruption um, associated with moving curbs or buying property to accommodate those changes. So, um, you know, curb to curb, 
projects can be delivered um, quicker and cheaper than boundary to boundary and let alone outside of boundary, which is you know the RMA process of designations and acquiring land. Um, an example of that form and function is looking at the lower stretch of Mount Eden Road. So um, this is just quite close to the Mount Albert Road intersection looking north. Um, as it currently is today, um, there's a roughly a 13.4 um, curb to curb road width and a 20 and a half meter boundary to boundary width. So um, purely taking a roads and streets assessment, um, taking what the modal priorities are and how to provide for cycling, you can fit it within a uh, boundary to boundary solution. Um, it does require shifting curbs out to narrow those footpaths um, and quite significant road reshaping. Um, this particular route and some of the others that we're looking at are historical tram routes. So they have the asphalt center with concrete um, driving lanes. So to reshape and re, um, reform that road is actually quite a huge undertaking to ensure that stormwater and everything else still drains correctly, um, let alone the utility relocations. And again, with the inner isthmus, a lot of these routes are quite old. So um, as we've found with other transport projects, um, a lot of the exact utility locations aren't, aren't known until the road's dug up, which again causes cost implications and delays. We're trying to be a little bit more innovative around how to deliver change and get cycling on these corridors, um, keeping curbs the same width, providing bus priority in one direction um, up until intersections, the, the distance between Mount Albert Road and Balmoral Road, which is the next intersection north of here, is approximately three k's. So, oh, sorry, two k's. So, providing that bus priority for maybe a kilometre either way, and it's switching. We've kind of deemed it a snake-style bus lane, as you can see here, where it would potentially swap over um, outside the Hunters Park um, shops there. So, providing for that southbound bus priority in the PM peaks and the northbound bus priority in the AM peaks and having it change over. So it's not the gold standard for bus priority, but it certainly um, is an improvement on, on what is there today. Um, maintaining a general traffic lane in each direction, fitting a bi-directional cycle lane in, again, for the space efficiencies. We kind of recognize that um, to get a good standard for a unidirectional facility, which is north and south movements on a cycle lane wouldn't quite be possible. So having that three meter with a with an adequate buffer for, for safety purposes and then keeping the footpaths um, at their at their current widths is, is good as well because that southern section is a large recreational area plus local schools in the area as well. So having a two meter footpath is, is not really ideal. Um, as I mentioned um, and then as part of the network assessment we also looked at um, the cycling business case and how that aligns with these corridors um, split into spines and local area networks to also support um, the corridor infrastructure changes so all that's been costed and modeled as well and that's where we ended up um, with the cycling single stage business case a long list of spines is kind of the ideal network of funding was um, was unlimited basically, and our long list of local area networks as well. Again, the network assessment um, broke down into sections of corridor and our assessment data, looking at levels of service for public transport, daily patronage levels, forecast patronage levels, cycle connectivity, how it was prioritized, and the modeled uh, cycle demand and cycle trips, and the safety risks as well. So all those. Um, all those inputs were were calculated to, to get to arrive at a shortlist for the network assessment. Um, and again, looking at how those funding streams can, can be tied to different levels. Um, so high levels of investment versus not so high levels of investment and what could be delivered. Um, the network assessment arrived at a preferred option, um, which is shown here. So. Um, Again, the yellow, just in case you can't quite see it, the yellow is separated cycle facilities, green is public transport improvements and safety improvements are kind of given along the way. Um, small things such as pairing bus stops with signalized pedestrian crossings, um, slowing speed through town centers down to 30 Ks, um, potential mid block reductions in speed as well. Um, Obviously, the network assessment came up with costs and benefits. Um, it identified a $1.2 billion investment program. Um, 
had a great benefit cost ratio of 3.2 and some of those outcomes were at accelerated uh, mode share to bus by 19%, um, accelerated cycle mode share by approximately 3%, which represents 10,000 additional riders. Um, that is unfortunately a limit of the model current um, that we were using at the time, it could only model journeys to work. So that doesn't take into account recreational trips or um, trips to school, et cetera. So that is kind of a, an under-representation um, and significant reduction in deaths and serious injuries on the corridors as well, um, which is which is really good to see. Um, and it's just the cables showing, um, showing travel time benefits um, and patronage level benefits for, for buses, um, network uh, cycle, work benefits, um, showing growth in, in numbers, and the reduction in deaths and serious injuries as well. So as a summary, um, the network assessment sets our investment framework with the expected outcomes uh, for the development of the, of the corridors. As corridors go through the design gateways, options will be identified and confirmed, and then those costs and benefit streams from the network assessment can be updated. Um, the network assessment was endorsed by the AT Board Design and Delivery Committee in November of 2020. Um, we have a proposed and staged pipeline developed for um, 550 million funding levels within the 10 years for ATAP and RLTP purposes. And um, as our engagement goes through, the timeline for corridors is being confirmed and New North Road is, um, is our test case for that. To move into COVID impacts, like probably or everyone here, it's had large, probably personal and professional impacts. Um, in 2020, um, the program was paused um, for engagement. We had anticipated to begin um, public engagement in March and April of 2020. Um, and at the time, um, the direction was, you know, large uncertainty. So um, consultation on a regional wide change of that significance wasn't encouraged and then shortly following after March 2020 Council's emergency budget had a large impact on available funding for not just our program but many others as um, most of the funding was committed for existing projects um, so we had to have a change of pace and reprioritization of funding and again yet to see impacts of um, this year's um, lockdowns. With the current regional land transport plan, we've um, prioritised our corridors even further. Um, the constrained funding envelope led to 10 years um, to identify that 550 million uh, delivery pipeline. The, that assessment criteria included urgency, um, including alignment with other investments such as the Central Rail Link um, in Mount Eden and New North Road area, um, maintenance and renewals, and the Eastern Busway uh, towards Ellerslie and Pamuir. Um, alignment with objectives, assessment of data outcomes, severity of transport issues and the benefit stream opportunities and the deliverability, the ease of construction of potential solutions. So again, that ties in with that curb shifting, curb to curb um, solution differences and alignment with uh, local board and community support as well. Um, so again, the network assessment provided a really, really solid um, evidence base for us to push for a our successful bid in the 21 to 23 regional land transport plan. Um, so we've secured that 583 million over 10 years for the following corridors and I won't run through them all, but you can kind of see on the map there. And that's the prioritized ones for the next three. Um, and again, staged uh, funding released over the RLTP period for the next three. So jumping into some corridor design challenges that we that we've been looking at. Um, this particular project, uh, Great North Road, it's from the Karangahapi Ponsonby Road intersection through to the Greyland Village shops. Um, it had kind of been languishing within Auckland Transport for, for a few years with cost overruns and um, a few designs not quite meeting certain standards. So um, our team picked that up as a refresh. Um, provides for, it's a two kilometer length of, of route, um, has a unidirectional cycle lane um, with block separation. Um, there is minor curb work at bus stops to provide for um, what's called an island style bus stop where possible. Um, and it's at roughly 18 million cost estimate. So it's, again, it's a curb to curb option, but it's certainly not cheap. Um, 
Great North Road did have the available space for cycling and bus in most of the existing curb line through reallocation of the flush median and narrowing up a few um, few lanes where, where, where we could. So it did have that luxury. It wasn't um, looking to, to narrow footpaths by cutting into those curbs and avoided significant um, utility works due to that. So some of the other um, design challenges that we're looking at Obviously, the different costs for different facilities is huge. Um, exploring options for curb to curb solutions and boundary boundary to so solutions and what trade offs and level of service for um, bus, general traffic and cycling is is um, is acceptable, basically. Um, curb to curb woods limit options for both cycling and two way bus priority on the majority of our corridors due to that 20, um, roughly 20 meter width. Um, Curb shifting on one or both sides increases costs significantly due to the utilities and services. Um, providing bus priority in one direction is a solution. Again, as I touched on in the Mount Eden example on the approaches to intersections, it does come out as a, as a trade-off for the bus level of service, um, but you can fit a 2.8 to 3 meter bi-directional cycle lane. Um, some of the design challenges that we will be undertaking on a lot of these corridors is how um, those bi-directional cycle lanes may interact with bus stops, um, how, how much space we do have either within the existing road reserve or within footpath space to provide for the ideal um, solution is something like this where um, bus passengers can hop on and off onto a separated island and then cross a pedestrian crossing to the footpath. Um, that's ideal for frequent bus services and busy bus services. So, most of the ones that we're looking at fall into this category um, and where space constraints are really, really tight. Um, these these ones where um, cyclists would have a ramp or so to encourage a slow speed and passengers would be hopping off directly off the bus onto that um, cycle lane. Intersection challenges, obviously running bus lanes and cycle lanes through an intersection. Um, severely impacts either turning movements and capacities of those intersections. So really looking at reallocation of road space, um, signal phasing and changes at many of these busy intersections. Uh, many of them have state highway interactions as well. Um, and obviously there's huge network implications when restricting or banning turning movements at, at certain intersections, getting those safe cycle lanes through them. Um, and again, safe systems designs of these intersections, race tables, slower speeds, and those sorts of things. And whether we look at bus lanes going through an intersection like that top example versus them ending just prior to an intersection um, at, at, the, at the bottom example there. And New North Road. Um, this is our first corridor to begin engagement from, from the start. Um, it's 11 k's in length, runs from the city centre all the way to Avondale and passes through um, quite a few local shopping centres and town centres. Um, some of the benefits of the change that we've been looking at through um, the options that we've um, almost finalised now is um, a safe system design, reducing the annual deaths and serious injuries from between five um, to two per annum. Um, urban realm and landscaping improvements at town centres along these corridors. And we're looking at nine kilometres of separated cycle lane facilities, which would increase uh, daily ridership by approximately 1,500 to 2,500. Um, Accommodate growth, again, tying into that um, unitary plan and other government changes around housing. Um, an additional 40,000 people are expected to live near or adjacent to the corridor by 2041. Um, road space reallocation for, um, for the corridor form and function to provide for cycling and improved public transport. So removing flush medians and uh, removal of parking. Um, bus lanes, we're looking at approximately 8 to 11 k's of bus lanes, bus priority and uh, by way of um, bus gates at intersections or B advance signals. Um, and doing the changes that we are anticipating would be looking at um, daily patronage growth between two and 3,000 passengers and approximately a 10 to 15 minute journey time saving from um, Avondale to the city centre, which is quite huge. Um, also looking at CO2 emissions by 2% per annum on, on the corridor and as part of New North Road um, being the test case for our engagement approach is increasing our levels of engagement with communities for the corridor um, and the project life cycle and outcomes.
So some examples of what we're looking at on New North Road um, for, for different options is whether there's two ways of um, bus priority in each direction, um, bi-directional cycle lanes on each, um, sorry, and having a snake style bus lane, so bus lanes on approaches to an intersection, or where we potentially widen sections by cutting into some footpath space um, to get the, um, the north and south or east-west bound um, bus priority combined with the cycle facilities. And again, New North Road does run through numerous town centres. There's Uptown, there's Kingsland, Morningside, um, the Rocket Park area, um, Mount Albert and Avondale. So accommodating loading and servicing in these village centres, um, options around wider footpaths, um, you know, all those things that, that people want and then the village centres. Um, so quite radical change from, from what, what is there currently. Our anticipated timeframes for New North Road. Um, as I mentioned, we're currently progressing three options for our business case for New North Road that have been uh, developed with community insights with helps from our collaboration panels. Um, we are aiming for public engagement on these options in February, March of 22 and arriving at a preferred option in mid 22 and then um, hoping to begin detailed design on those sections mid to late in 22. Um, we're anticipating that we'll involve our collaboration panels along this process so it won't just be ending um, when the business case is done because um, a lot of the details will be worked out in detailed design as well. So we're essentially agreeing that form and function of the corridor and then moving forward to, to actual detailed design, which is where the fun starts. Um, so of the common elements that we're looking at across all our approaches for New North Road, um, specific safety treatments, including mid-block mid crossings, and safer speed limits, a cycle connection between Avondale and the city centre, bus lanes for enhanced priority and reliable journeys, tree planting and landscaping where possible, curbside management plans for loading and parking, particularly in those village centre areas, uh, and improved pedestrian facilities. Um, in case you were after any more information, if you haven't already, um, there's two websites there, one for Connected Communities as the program and one for New North Road as the project as part of that program. All right, that's great. Thanks, Anthony. Um, so we've got Not a few problem. questions here and I'll, um, I'll just uh, pose them to you and, and if you can answer them as we go, that'd be fantastic. Um, so the first one uh, is around the amount of investment you're making in, in community engagement, marketing and communications. You're obviously looking to spend a lot of money on Capital Works, or it's a, it's a large program. And so the question is, how much has been allocated to community communication, marketing and engagement? I don't know the answer to that, I'm afraid, yeah. As a percentage, I would not know. Um, yeah, that is something we could come back to though. Okay, uh, the next one is, um, you talked about utilities um, during your presentation. Uh, and this question is around um, whether or not you're looking to try and improve stormwater runoff as uh, part of this work as well. Um, yes, yes. Um, where possible, even within curb to curb solutions, um, there is improvements to stormwater. Um, the Great North Road project, um, as referred to in some of my slides, is looking at um, changes to catch pits um, for yeah improved stormwater quality. Fantastic. And it would be a given um, for any time of curb shifting. It's it's sort of a given that that there is stormwater improvements as well. So, okay, thanks, there, Anthony. Um, there's a lot of planning on paper options being investigated here. Uh, the question is, what opportunities have been investigated to pilot or trial corridor solutions? And I suppose you might have alluded to that a little bit during the conversation around New North um, to help people understand the change before making things permanent, maybe I suppose on a longer length or along an entire corridor or multiple corridors. Yeah. Um... Great question, and it, and it's a little bit tricky when we are looking at corridor-wide change, but it would be great for particularly um, village areas as trialling for wider footpaths um, at the sake of removal of parking, for example. Um, 
but what we're trying to do because we are currently in the business case phase get that agreed form and function for the corridor and then as designs emerge we can potentially trial them in the, in the future so there is hopefully great space for those opportunities moving forward um, it does require good community relationships as Auckland Transport has found with um, innovating streets some examples went great some didn't so what we're really hoping for as part of um, our engagement with the community and representatives from the community and local boards thus far is that we will have that public backing and, and support when changes are needed. Thank you. Um, so there's a question here around the focus and um, looking at the network diagram, I suppose, that you, uh, um, you showed, it seems to be focused on the isthmus. Um, has there been work outside the isthmus to make uh, active modes more friendly or accommodate um, active modes outside the central sort of isthmus area? Because it seems to be focused just on that area. Yeah, yeah, correct. Um, this is where Auckland Transport, as Metro Safety and Walking and Cycling, we've had a significant overlap in their anticipated 10 year projects. That is not to say 80 Metro. The safety team or the cycle team aren't investigating um, solutions elsewhere in Auckland like North Shore for example or further east. Um, Connected Communities does reach as far as Papakura in the south, as far as Pakuranga in the east, as far as Henderson in the west, um, but it is those core arterial routes in the isthmus that carry, uh, that carry a lot of the bus patronage um, when modelled for cycle outcomes, it does uh, they do have the greatest number for for cycle demand, and it was where the existing safety problems were ranked some of the highest. So, um, yes, it does appear isthmus focused, but a lot of that is where the demands and the needs are, and it's not to dismiss um, by any means elsewhere. Um, but it is, yeah, that's that's kind of the the bus network. Um, and where yeah, safety and cycle improvements were planned over the next 10. So. Okay, uh, next question here is around the emissions reduction uh, plan targets for the city, um, uh, targeting a 20% reduction. This is talking about VKT, which I'm not sure whether it's directly related to emissions per se, but uh, in terms of emission reductions, um, how uh, how are the designs or are they being measured um, to assess how how much of an impact you're likely to make or how, how can you how can you show what it is you're doing in terms of reduced emissions as part of this work um, for new north road we've modeled that it would be approximately a two percent reduction and i know that that sounds small um but it is just one one corridor so we are um and i know that is part of um where are we here? I had that in my notes. Um, it is part of a new policy, policy for, driven. For that corridor or, or yes, for, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for New North Road. Um, so it is part of um, policy that we will end up pivoting and, and adapting um, designs may may be a result of that policy as well. There's a question here about um, the corridor identification in terms of how you first actually uh, went through or the process you went through to identify the 10 uh, primary corridors. Um, and so if you can describe that maybe a little bit and can you go into a little bit more detail on how the designs were initiated and then progressed and how design challenges have been resolved. So it's a big, big question, that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess, it started off with um, the Metro team, safety team and cycle team all looking at certain areas within um, what was the, the previous regional land transport plan timeframe. So they had all gone off, gone off and put together their plans for the, the following 10 years and overlapping those projects, the corridors chosen immediately popped out as like a, these teams are investigating the same routes um the same you know essentially the same problems for lack of bus reliability good potential for patronage growth lack of separated cycle facilities but good demand for safe cycle facilities and safety problems with you know deaths and serious injuries being a, a large concern so those routes 
were highlighted in terms of transport data. Um, so that's essentially how they were chosen. Um, and, you know, it was an internal um, thing around allocation of budgets to get that aligned um, in terms of design challenges. Um, some of them will be worked out still. We are in the business case phase for, for the corridors. That particular section that I mentioned of Great North Road was a design project that connected communities picked up. So that has had some design challenges around um, safety you know, since 2018, a lot of safety standards have changed. So sight lines requires um, quite big changes for, for movements in and out of side streets, um, for on-road parking removal. Um, the cycle lane requires um, slower speeds for traffic going across that cycle lane. So raised tables at intersections, um, slower speeds, you know, so it's all things have changed since um, the inception and it's just part of design work to adapt to those. So there will be um, design challenges for New North Road. I quickly highlighted a couple, um, maybe potentially around side road treatments and bus stop interactions with cycle facilities and pedestrians, but yeah, that's just to name, name two. Fantastic. And uh, encourage anyone else to ask some questions and while you're maybe doing that, I might ask a, a couple. Um, historically, uh, projects have very much been based on um, efficiency of movement um, and delays uh, in terms of justification for, uh, you know, pushing them forward. Um, so in terms of your um, balancing of corridor space and allocation to different modes, um, how, how are you dealing with that challenge, I suppose, in terms of uh, presumably some modes will end up being delayed longer and economically that might be working against you. Yes, yeah, yeah, in terms of costs and benefit um, ratios, the impact on, on general traffic does come at a cost. Um, but um, that again is a, a decision for the decision makers when we come up with solutions around what is an acceptable level of trade-off, um, particularly around intersections, as I mentioned. So, you know, is banning a left and a right turn at a busy intersection acceptable? You know, those sorts of questions will be posed um, in our options and design solutions. So, um, yeah, those impacts will be modelled and, yeah, um, anticipated effects will be taken into account. So it's taking a more balanced approach rather than necessarily a straight economic approach in terms of other right. outcomes you're trying to uh, you're trying to achieve or, or deliver on? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yep. Um, what will success look like? Essentially that network assessment map, in my mind, um, separated cycle facilities across a bulk of these corridors, slower speeds, less deaths and serious injuries, and public transport, um, by the way, bus for these corridors picking up um, a large percentage of mode share. So yeah. Um, I think that's what success would look like. And I think at large community acceptance, um, we do acknowledge that will always be um, resistance to change because change is always, um, is always met with resistance regardless of change. Um, but what we have found during our um, collaboration panels, uh, discussions on New North Road is sort of socializing those trade-offs helps greatly. Um, you know, particularly around road reallocation, um, changes happening on these corridors, regardless of these projects, you know, through intensification and through parking changes, through other policy driven changes. So um, we're essentially a tool to drive that even further, I think. So if that is what success looks like, will you be setting up means of measuring um, those, uh, those factors or those, uh, measures of change uh, to see whether or not you've delivered on those? Yes, yes, as part of our business case um, process, the benefit realisation will be, um, oops, sorry, what's called benefit realisation will be undertaken yeah. Yeah, to ensure because as a corridor by corridor basis, you know, so if New North Road is first, by the time we get to our second or third, it could be measured. Um, hopefully some projects on New North would have gone ahead. So there's a question here on um, how's communi uh, connected communities responding to and planning for quickly changing travel dynamics? 
Um, you know, you mentioned COVID during your um, during your presentation. So there's working from home changes with COVID-19, uh, light rail, etc. Um, the one I was going to ask, which I'd throw in there as well, is around um, electrification of uh, bikes. Yeah. Um, touch firstly on on um, COVID impacts. Um, yes, working from home has, has had a huge impact for, for many, many people. Um, what was shown last year was when alert level changed changes occurred in level, you know, when we dropped to level one and two in Auckland. Um, patronage did bounce back, not to pre-COVID levels, but it did show strong growth and potentially the uncertainties when Auckland did change between level three and then back to level two and one quite a few times last year. It did have that sort of, I guess, uncertainty around how safe um, you are in, in contained environments. So, um, but I think moving forward with, you know, New Zealand has rolled out a vaccine at, at quite high levels. So um, I would think by a little bit into next year, we'll have some certainty and, and um, safety around being in, being in spaces with people. Um, so yeah, getting back to pre-COVID patronage levels is, is certainly something that, that's forecast to happen and continue to grow. Um, as population grows, we can't just be, uh, relying on private vehicle travel for all trips. So it is, it's kind of a given. Um, sorry, what was the next part? Um, so it was uh, trains, COVID, light rail with from home. Yeah, light rail interaction. So um, it looks like Dominion Road is the preferred uh, route for um, light rail. So interactions with Sandringham Road, Mount Eden Road will have um, not just during construction, but post as well. So, um, and where light rail touches onto, you know, towards the city centre as well, um, we will adapt around those um, plans because, you know, light rail is, is the bigger um, project. Likewise with CRL, um, we're working very closely with the um, Alliance team there around Mount Eaton Road and New North Road where those um, roads converge into the city centre there and the expected changes around um, that Mount Eden precinct will be dramatic too for pedestrian, cyclists and um, and bus users. Um, and sorry, that last one was... Well, just around, I suppose, um, e-bikes oh, e and whether yes. or not uh, um, modelling that might have been done a few years ago has been either blown out of the water because of a huge uptake or modeling is just shown and and it's come through as as expected in terms of numbers mm. um i know models off to under represent cycle uptake um but in terms of e-bike i i guess it would correlate more to the infrastructure potentially required um that is one benefit of a bi-directional cycle lane there is more room for overtaking particularly if if we are looking at um, peak directional flows, you know, like it does provide a, up to three, three and a half meter wide space. So if someone is traveling slowly up a hill, an e-bike person can safely overtake. Um, some e-bikes are more confident users in general traffic as well. So that's, that's yeah, that's, yeah. But in terms of uptake of more cycling, then yeah, that's, that's it, hopefully that has been captured by the model. I, I don't know particularly if that is or not. Okay. Any closing questions from anyone that they'd like to uh, pose um, before we uh, close things out? So I'll um, say on behalf of everyone that's attended, thank you very much, Anthony. It's uh, certainly uh, um, a very significant project and uh, very interesting and, and it will be uh, Great to see um, how it evolves over the next few years. Um, yeah, great, thanks, David. And hopefully, it uh, hopefully it delivers on all those um, measures of success that you're looking to looking to achieve. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, no, we have got a couple of last ones. Um, is there a recognised Mo shift percentage for cycling trips? So this is, I suppose, uh, about a success measure, possibly. Um, um, in terms of what would success look like for a mode share? 
I'm, the, I'm, I'm the, guessing that's what it's trying to say. Is 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 there a recognised yeah. mode shift percentage? Of, yeah, so it's a mode shift into cycling the, that you're trying to achieve. I know, the, I know the cycling program business case had mode share goals. I can't quite remember off the top of my head what those percentages are. Sorry, um, but that is undergoing a refresh at the moment. It's still in like a draft form, so they may be refreshing their anticipated. Um, mode share numbers as well so that would be um something that i can make note of to to check on so but you have also noted that uh you're going to be running a benefit realization um process yeah. which i yeah. suppose is key um yeah that I'm would sure be that. modeling uh, not modeling uh recording and and monitoring um cycle numbers like likewise and with public transport numbers too because that's a, a large part both uh, and dsi reductions so and then, uh, well, this is, a, I suppose, a personal comment from someone. Great to see some progress in their neighbourhood. So, um, obviously, oh, one of those uh, one of those corridors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I live near Great South Road, but yeah, that's a little bit further off down our program time frame. But yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> right. All right. Well, thank you again, Anthony, and um, thanks everyone for attending. And uh, Merry Christmas, and uh, we'll see you all uh, in the new year. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.